If anyone wants to follow along, uh, you can download. Um, there's going to be two sets of slides uh, from GitHub, uh, JuliaCon 2015. Um, one thing to keep in mind, though, is there is a data folder that has approximately 250 megabytes worth of data in it. Um, you can either download it live over the Wi-Fi or from Amazon, or you can clone it from GitHub. Uh, but in either case, if you aren't that interested in following along and just want the slides, you may just want to take the notebooks. Well, you won't be able to do the examples without the data, but if you don't want to download 250 megabytes and then unzip them and, and do that, then just take the notebooks. I don't know how to do it from Julia Box. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, do you mean sync to Julia Box? Yeah. Uh, I think it's pretty easy. It was, it works like in the G, um, with the Julia Box GPU. Yeah, I don't know if Julia Box is like you. Clone to a GPU. I don't know, maybe. Mm -hmm. Try it one way to find out. Yeah. I'm just excited to be doing bike share data. I've been studying PC bike share data. Well, I'm, I'm just excited that there's a non zero number of people here, so. <laughs> Uh, well, when, I, <laughs> when I saw that uh, Arch was going to be the other talk uh, and, and he's doing high performance, I actually want to go to that talk myself. Um, and so it's been kind of a, like I said, I'm glad there's a non-zero number of people here. Um, so I guess we'll get started. Uh, so my name is Randy Switch. Um, I work at uh, Comcast. Um, just as a disclaimer, nothing I talk about here has anything to do with Comcast. Um, that's probably a good thing. Um, I, there's going to be two talks. So this is a 90-minute time slot. But um, there's only so much you can talk about uh, relative to uh, bike share data. Um, so I actually have two presentations prepared. One is going to be the one that's on the screen now, and there's going to be a second one that talks about the Vega visualization library um, that I've been working on. Um, so we'll go through this example. I don't know, maybe take a five or ten minute break, uh, and then we'll go through the second set of examples. Okay, so if you were at the regular conference, um, obviously, it's, it's, it's a very enthousi enthusiast crowd, um, so everyone is extremely advanced. Um, I was presuming that there would be at least some beginners here um, from Julia. Um, I guess the good thing about this being taped is for the next 1,000 users or 10,000 users, uh, there will be at least one talk that somebody can look at and say, this actually resembles something I might actually do. Uh, as opposed to maybe astrophysics or genome sequencing, which um, that's really not my background. Uh, so what I wanted to do was just show uh, using um, the City Bike API um, for New York City um, how to work with APIs, how to do some common uh, summarizations uh, using the data frames package. Um, I also wanted to show some just common visualizations to answer business type questions. So this will be a very lightweight, uh, I think easy to understand talk. Uh, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Just let's uh, have as, as interactive as possible. Okay, so if you're not familiar, uh, Citibank um, piloted a program in New York City. I believe they also do it here in Boston. Uh, Philadelphia has a different type of company, but it's a bike sharing program where you can either um, buy a, a subscription to um, use bikes, you take them from one station and then you return them to another one, or I think you can pay on a per uh, ride fee. And what's really great about uh, the City Bike New York City program is that they provide uh, historic data, as well as a real-time API um, that requires no authentication. So they really want to um, encourage people to analyze their data and to show uh, what the success of the program is, um, as well as allowing application developers 
to uh, extend their functionality. So here's just a, a quick picture of the, the website. So their visualization isn't so helpful because the, uh, the bike arrow icons are so big that it basically shows you where Manhattan is. Um, otherwise, it really doesn't give you that much. It, it is creeping somewhat into Brooklyn. Um, but this, this is the, the, the page that they show you when you go to the, the city bike site. Okay. So what example I want to do is cover all of 2014. Um, and they provide uh, archived data sets for every month where they tell you um, down to the ride level um, characteristics of the, the customer that rented the bike, um, where they got the bike from, uh, latitude and longitude, um, the duration of their bike trip, um, and, and several other attributes. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the, and analyze the entire uh, 2014 um, data set. So this is the data directory that I was talking about from GitHub. So I already have this downloaded on my computer. Um, if you clone this from GitHub, I suspect it will be slower than if you clone it directly from uh, City Bikes Amazon S3 bucket. But at the same time, if everyone connects to the S3 bucket from here, I don't know if that will kick everyone off. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see how it goes. Okay. So the first thing I do is just you know I'm setting my working directory uh, to. And so if you run this bottom set of commands, it's really just a simple loop. And you know, so we can see that it's really somewhat trivial to um, download a lot of data, and in this case, you know, 12 CSV file or 12 zip files um, that uh, get extended for CSV. And then finally, at the bottom, I uh, just do a quick shell command um, that uh, unzips all of the files so that we don't have to. Um, really deal with that inside of Julia. It's just at, at the operating system level. So when you do this, <laughs> you will see something like the following. MIT has surprisingly good Wi-Fi. Um, so it won't take very long. Okay, so you know at the bottom you can sort of see 12 archives were su successfully processed. That's the output of the final command that unzips all of the files. So now in, in a directory um, that will be similar to, to the working directory I'm using, you'll have 24 files now. You have the zip files, you also have the CSV files. And from there, um, we can go ahead and create a data frame with all this data. Um, hopefully everyone's familiar with how to load libraries. Again, like I said, I realize that everyone here is pretty much uh, an enthusiast of Julia, so this, this is perhaps not uh, the talk for, for everyone. But. Um, and then the next thing we can do is, uh, rather than try and write all these things out by hand, um, we can just select the, the CSV files. And the one thing that's interesting about this is how real worldly it is. So with a lot of the other talks, you know, talking about Large Hadron Collider and, and all these other things, there is, I would assume, some level of control. Uh, but what you can see here from the, uh, the file descriptions is the file, des the, the file names uh, change uh, naming format, and it is the case that they also change file format. So we'll talk about how to deal with that. Okay. Now, this is an extremely wasteful operation, um, but this is one way that you could build a data frame from all 12 of the files. Um, if you run this, it's going to take approximately five minutes or so. Um, it's a very naive way to create 
a single data frame, um, and it's very wasteful from a memory perspective. Um, as every time you loop through this, um, the data frame gets copied. So on the first time through, it's not a big deal. The first file gets read in, a data frame gets copied. But because we keep renaming on top of DF, DF stays in memory while the next one is loading. And then because you're using uh, VCAT or vertical concatenation, uh, it does that concatenation. You have two copies at one point. And then once the file's been read, then it, the next one goes. So each time, uh, I would think it's actually, well. It, it, OK, so there's an append function by the, the person who wrote the majority of the data frames library. Um, but this is certainly a naive way to do it. Um, I've already done this, so we're not going to um, waste that, that, that much time. The, the point of this is, though, is if you wanted to learn on, on a real-world data set, it's not hard to acquire uh, real-world data to play around with. In this case, um, there was just over 8 million rides um, that City Bike provides data for um, for the 2014 period. Um, and then they give you 15 attributes. So we can just find that using the size, um, the size function. Okay. So now if we want to go on and actually explore this data set, um, we're all set. We have one big table. Again, it has 15 columns in it. So if we want to just figure out what, what's in there, certainly we can use names. So again, like I said before, uh, trip duration, um, the station where they started, latitude, longitude. Um, and then the last three are actually the interesting ones. So user type, um, birth year, and gender. So they do provide um, some demographic statistics, uh, or demographic attributes, excuse me, so that we can calculate statistics and understand how people are using uh, the bike share program in New York City. We can understand by age, by gender, um, and then by the type of license that you have, whether you have a, a subscription or you're a one-time rider. Now, because there's 15 columns, it really doesn't fit well uh, on the slide. So um, I was just going to, here using the head function, we can see um, just partially what our data looks like. We have the trip duration, which is in seconds. Um, we have the start time and end time. Uh, the station ID, and again, there's 11 other attributes that go along with this data set. Um, one thing that we could do is uh, go through and actually do describe. Um, actually, I, I am going to do this to, to make the point. So there's a lot of areas uh, for improvement in terms of performance, um, and this is one of them. The uh, describe function is uh, quite a bit slower um, then if you're familiar with R and have used their um, functionality to describe data sets. Um, and the reason I point this out is not to point at John, but actually to point at myself. So I modified this function um, because I wanted uh, to get descriptive statistics for strings. So I put a horribly inefficient way of doing this uh, into this function and pretty much made it useless. Um, I always meant to go back and fix that, and, and uh, I guess there's still time. Uh, but what you get is, um, for numeric uh, attributes, you'll get your basic summary statistics. And then for strings, it will go through and tell you how many strings actually have a value relative to being blank and the percentage value, and then the number of unique levels. So you can understand whether or not um, the value that you have is a key column, or if it's a factor type of column where it has maybe a dozen levels. Um, so, I th no, this is actually still running. Um, what's nice is it prints out the output at least during the, during the period, so you can get excited for when a new, new summary statistic shows up. Um, we should be done pretty soon. And then, of course, Julia doesn't know anything about the data, uh, just like any other programming language wouldn't. So you do occasionally get things that are uh, weird summaries, like birth year. Knowing what the average birth year really isn't kind of useful, but it is certainly printed out. 
Um, and you can also do this by column, which is uh, a lot more efficient. So if, if we just indexed into the, um, the data frame for trip duration, you can see that it's nearly instantaneous. Again, kind of proving my point about how uh, I broke the function with, with, the, with the string processing. Okay, so, so we have our data, we've kind of looked at it. Um, now there's any number of ways to actually visualize this data. Um, and what's funny is, is that I, I wrote at least, at least this part of the slides before I got to JuliaCon, uh, and there's like at least three or four more libraries that have been presented uh, in the last couple of days. So this isn't even an exhaustive set. Um, if you wanted to go through, um, there are a lot of great visualization libraries. Uh, I think Gadfly is sort of the uh, incumbent at this point. Um, Vega, I think, is uh, a very great library, and I'll tell you why later. Uh, and then, of course, Plotly uh, is great. Uh, Bokeh is great by um, the Continuum Python guys. So, again, there's a lot of great ways to, to look at our data. I'm going to uh, use Gadfly for this. So in terms of the business questions that we can visualize, um, I just picked out three here. So how does overall ridership change month to month? So the one thing that's obvious about riding the bike is, is there's a, a really good period of time and then there's some really bad periods of time. So for someone like myself, I would never ride my bike in December, right? It's just gonna be too cold on the East Coast. Um, I know there are some very hardcore people that ride you know, year round. Uh, and then the same thing, um, in the middle of July, I probably am not going to be riding a bike to wherever I'm going because I would be so sweaty that I probably would not think that a bike was, you know, appropriate transportation. But regardless, we can look at that and plot this and understand how the people of New York City are using bikes by month. Um, secondly, uh, does the duration of the ride vary per month? So the same reason. So if you have this temperature effect, um, if people are riding in December, do they ride really short rides relative to perhaps you know, April when it's a really nice day out and they you know, take the bike out all day? So again, we can evaluate that. And then finally, uh, do men and women participate differently in the ride share program? And does age matter? So we can answer all three of these questions or four of these questions. Um, very easily uh, using visualizations. Okay. So if we want to use the Gadfly library, um, again, we just load it up. Um, and as I said before, what's, what's interesting about this example is how real worldly it is. So um, with, with my work in industry, um, you often get just files that you wonder why somebody would do something like that. Why, you know, why would the file format just change in the middle, changing the date format, uh, changing the number of columns, all of a sudden going from commas to tab delimited and so forth. Uh, in this case, what City or their vendor did um, was switch the date format. So um, there's a simple function here to actually fix that. So what we have is a, a date part function that I wrote that just takes in a string and it looks to see if there's a, it does a regular expression to see or excuse me, not a regular expression, just a, a simple match to understand whether or not they're using uh, hyphens between their dates or if they're using uh, slashes between their dates. And once we do that, um, we can just do a simple uh, list comprehension to add a new column called month to actually parse out what month this is in. Since we're doing all 2014, um, I didn't feel that it was necessary to actually fix the date stamps, right? We just know that the data set goes from January 2014 to December 2014, and thus month is sufficient. And then finally, uh, I just did a quick, uh, added a quick random number to the data set. Um, because when we get to Gadfly, you don't really want to plot 8 million points. Um, humans can't really deal with that much information. Uh, computers can't really render that in a, in a decent way. Um, so we'll use just the random number to uh, make our data set smaller and easier to, to visualize. So if we wanted to just you know, start off with the question of, of how, to, how to rides... <laughs> I guess I have to run this. Oh, 
Oh, it's definitely still loading Gadfly. Uh, I actually preloaded all of the libraries before the, the talk to try and compress this down a little bit. Um, but again, even though you know, we're going through this, there, there are 8 million records. So we are doing a, a bit of data transformation here. It's not a, a non-trivial amount of data. We have 8 million records. It's probably something like 5 gigabytes uh, of data once it's in a, a data frame in RAM. So it, it will take, I don't know, 30 seconds maybe. So the, so the file formats are actually, they're, they're exactly the same. They just change the, within the date form column, the, the, the date stamp, they change the format of the date. So, you know, that's the worst type of error, in my opinion. When, when you can't stack files over, you know, on top of each other, it's pretty obvious that you're going to need to do something. When the, the files all still have the same format, but the, the data type or the data formats change inside the columns, uh, that's the worst type of error. Um, so like even you know, data sets like this, we're using 8 million records at work, I frequently use billions or even trillions of rows, and you don't really look, you know, you're not gonna hand observe a million or a billion or a trillion records, uh, so you just fight with lots of errors. So, uh, yeah, Gadfly. Just to be clear, I didn't break the string processing in general in, in Julia, just in the describe function. So the date parse function is as fast as it's going to be, I suppose. Well, wait, can I ask you a question about data frames? Absolutely. I'm going to punt to Jacob, who's right here. Uh, we actually had quite, a, quite an interesting discussion at dinner time about this. So since it's his comment, I'll let him comment about his own opinion. No, so my data frame is OK, right? And, and it's good. It's, it's OK for certain tasks. But, um, and, and, and I've talked with John about this, too. You can very quickly get into situations where you can't, you just can't get the performance that is really possible in Julia because of you know internal design and, and overall design decisions of data frames. And the other aspect is I come from a very strong SQL, you know, write and query sequence data, and that's a lot of how I think about transforming data. And so when I use a data frame, a lot of the operations I want to do are those. And uh, it's a lot of syntax overhead, personally, for me to like try and do what I want to do, and then sometimes it, it, you just can't. And, and it's because we're trying to coerce all of these different operations on the data frame. And, you know, it, it, it's certainly possible, but that's a lot of work to define all of the semantics and, and functionality to work on the data frame without just actually being like an SQL table that, you know, supports four SQL. So this is actually a good segue now that the, the data has finished uh, loading. Uh, this is one of those operations. So if you're familiar with SQL, this would just be a group by. Uh, but what you end up doing here is uh, using the by function, uh, pass the data frame. Uh, the month refers to the column month, uh, you know, and it's listed as a symbol. And then we have an anonymous function um, that uh, is sort of cheating here or at least not the way that you would think about it. So here's that cognitive overhead. So if you use the size function, it will tell you how many rows that you have per, um, in a data set. And the by function here breaks up a data frame by the column that you're using. So I'm applying the size function to each of the by groups. And in this way, 
you're getting a count of the number of rows per month and where each row represents a, a ride um, that somebody took on a bicycle. So when you're talking about people who are familiar with SQL versus not, this is very awkward. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense why this works, uh, if you think in a really heavy SQL syntax, um, but it does work. So when we run this, it doesn't take too long. Um, I believe it's part of the data frames package. Um, this is kind of what Jacob was uh, referring to. There's, there's operations that can only go along with um, you know, certain types of data objects. And, and, in, and for a, a common array, it wouldn't make sense, right? So I don't want to get into the, the difference between arrays and matrices that would, or excuse me, uh, matrices and data frames, because that would sort of derail this whole thing. But it only really makes sense to do by group uh, processing um, in a data frame where the columns are implicit, explicitly um, put together. Okay, so then you can see here the term in terms of the number of rides. Um, it's very clear that there's a monthly difference here. Um, in the early months of 2014, whether this program is ramping up or whether it's just plain cold outside in New York City, um, there's about a, th as th a third as many rides as there are in the summertime. And then when you get towards um, November, December, again, the rides trail off. Um, but an easier way to see this is actually to um, plot our data. And so here I'm using Gadfly. Um, the syntax probably looks familiar to everyone. Uh, when I get to the second part of my talk about Vega, I'm going to talk about Gadfly and what I'm trying to improve uh, upon how we plot things. I did not pre-warm uh, pre up for this one, so Gadfly is going to take uh, a little bit of time here. The rest of them shouldn't be so bad. Um, to, to repeat the question, it was, could the, the date parsing function be optimized? Um, possibly. Um, and it, you know, it really depends. I mean, because of the way what I was trying to do with just searching for whether or not there was um, a slash versus a hyphen to, delimit, to uh, determine the date type, there's probably a better way to do it. However, going across all those strings um, there's no type instability in, in that function as far as I know because you're staying in an ASCII string, you're looking for a string, and you return an ASCII string. So it's not, um, as far as I know, there shouldn't be any massive um, improvements that can be done. So when you plot uh, this function, now it's uh, a lot more obvious um, that the rideshare program is uh, dramatically more popular during the warm months relative to the cold months. And again, that, that's perhaps common sense, but uh, it, it is proven out here and, and easy to see um, with our bar chart. It's quantifiable. It's quantifiable, yes. Okay. So does the duration of rides vary per month? So that's another column that we have in our data. Um, we can go through and again use Gadfly and this is what I was talking about. So we're, we're going to do a, a box plot here. So if you're familiar with how box plots are calculated, you need to calculate five summary statistics. Um, we're doing this for 12 months, and then we have 8 million observations. So the question really becomes is, do we get anything from calculating our mean and median 25th and 75th percentiles and outliers um, from using 8 million records relative to, say, 1% uh, of that. And at least for this demonstration, I'm asserting that, no, you don't get any benefit from using all 8 million. Um, so when we run this, we're going to calculate box plot uh, on 1% uh, of the data.
Okay. And so what we can see um, is that, yes, the, the duration of the rides do vary per month. And we can see that by the length of the, the boxes for each of um, the, the columns here. And then, of course, the, the horizontal lines at the end, the, the whiskers, if you will, um, they also show that you know, at, the, um, at the extremes, the, the rides are much longer. Uh, and again, that it proves the hypothesis I was talking about before, where when it's nice out, people ride bikes longer. And when, um, when it's perhaps not so nice out, they ride shorter distances. Uh, and then the other thing that you notice about this is interesting, uh, or at least to me, is uh, by definition, the, the bottom bound is zero. You, you don't often see this um, in, in a lot of data that you're looking at, like when you're doing um, some sort of experiment, it's usually some non-zero. Uh, but in this case, the, um, the whiskers here are all you know, at zero because um, to have a, a, a rented bike ride, you have to have a non-zero amount of time. Okay. The dots represent um, potential outliers. So if I, I'm not exactly sure which uh, Gadfly uses in terms of um, the, the endpoints of the whiskers, if it's 95 or 99%. Uh, but all of those dots represent um, points that are potential outliers in the month that are you know, where the ride was so long um, that you may want to actually investigate. Uh, it's in seconds. Um, so it actually does make sense when you, when you look at it. Um, 3,600 seconds is an hour. Um, so you can see that most bike rides are about 20 minutes. So that makes sense. Uh, people are perhaps using it as an alternative to subway or you know, in the case where they're going from one part of the borough to another, that's just you know, 30 blocks or something. They just ride a bike. I did not know that. Thank you. Thank you for uh, contributing that. Uh, that is uh, very interesting. Um, that's where domain knowledge certainly comes in uh, when you're doing analytics, um, because I wouldn't have known that otherwise, that people are gaming the system. Um, poten potentially, I don't want to besmirch anybody. That, that's right. It's designed that way. Oh, OK. Well, so there you go. Um, and then finally, uh, do men and women participate differently, and does age matter? So what we can do here is, again, we can use by-group processing. And again, it's awkward, right? It doesn't, it doesn't feel like SQL does, um, or even Link, you know, that people brought up yesterday. Um, but again, we can go ahead and use the by function on our data frame. In this case, we'll do it by gender and birth year. Hopefully it won't take too long. Because again, we're trip duration is an integer, so we should be able to do this pretty fast. Okay, so now you can see that we have gender, uh, birth, year, and then average trip duration. 
Um, you know, as I talked about before, plotting 8 million points really isn't going to be an easy way once we get to a scatter plot. So I took the average here um, just to, to summarize the data down and make it a little easier for us to plot. And because I don't like sort of zero and one for gender, I just have a, a really simple function here to reclassify um, those values into character strings. And then the same thing with uh, you know, calculating age versus birth year. Um, it's a little hard to kind of do in your head, like you know, do people in 1979 use bikes differently than people that were born in 1984? Um, so if you just take 2015 minus um, the birth year that's reported, then we can go ahead and uh, get their age approximately. You know, I saw everyone else's presentation, I was like, that's really a shame when people have yellow text, and, and of course now I've done it here. So actually, let's, let's, let's change that real quick. Uh, it will take just but a second to re-render. Okay. Um, so what we can see here now is that with our scatter plot, we can see that there is a difference uh, between gender at least. Okay, so male is the navy blue and female uh, are the green riders. Now, like all descriptive statistics or descriptive plots, this doesn't tell us why, it just tells us it, it is, right? So is it because women ride further? Uh, is it because that men ride faster? Uh, do women use bikes differently than men? Uh, in some ways they are. We just don't know how, but we've shown that there is a difference uh, across the age groups on, on how men and women use the bikes. Um, now you can see that there's a lot of, lot of noise towards the 70 and above uh, age ranges. Uh, again, that's probably not surprising. Uh, if I thought about my grandparents riding bicycles, I'm not really sure what, how that would work out. Um, but if you look at the, the plot in general, it's approximately a horizontal line, which, which indicates that, that age really doesn't matter um, in sort of the prime years. And then once you get out further, um, we, we do a lot more noise in the data. Okay. So that's uh, just 2014. So as I said, City Bike really wants people to analyze their data. They provide these uh, files as CSVs, uh, but they actually have a real-time API. And what we're gonna do now is actually access the real-time API and plot where the most bikes are available um, in, in real time. Okay. And the way that we're going to do this is using the requests library. So um, this has been what I've used anytime I was, I've been accessing web APIs. Um, there's a handful of others. Um, so there's a handful of ways to do this. And then it returns uh, JSON objects. So we use the JSON library to parse the data. So as I talked about before, because they really want to be so, so open with the data, there's no um, authentication for their API. You just make a GET request, it returns, the, uh, it returns JSON back to you, um, you know, as opposed to something like, uh, I also wrote the Twitter package if anybody's used it. Um, that's a, a huge OAuth nightmare of signing tokens and, and doing all sorts of things. Um, and that's not an easy way to uh, get people to use your data. And, and I suspect that Twitter does that on purpose. But, uh, you know, in this case, it will take us um, literally just a few seconds to um, get the real-time data of bikes in New York City right now. Uh, it takes longer to load the libraries than it does to actually get the data. Okay, and as part of the, the request library, um, it will tell you, it returns a response object 
Um, and in this case, you know, the response code of 200 means we had a successful request. Um, so we did receive some message from the API. And when we use the, the JSON package to parse, parse the data, we can see that they re their JSON can be represented in Julia using the dictionary type with two entries. Um, there's the execution time, which you know, isn't really that helpful. And then there's the station list that has all of the data in it. So if we want to find out how many stations there are, we can go through and, and, and just, uh, again, use the size, um, the size function. So there's 329. Yeah, so if you, yeah, so if I go control, I would have thought it would take, take this long. It's only a few kilobytes of data. So that, th this is what was returned. I'm not quite sure what was taking so long uh, in terms of Julia, but um, so you see they, they return back uh, information about all of their stations um, in a JSON object, and then we translate that using um, the JSON library. So there's 329 stations um, in the city uh, bike program. And if we want to find out what, what data they return back, it's slightly different than the archive data that they return to you. So because this is real time, um, they don't give you the demographic information. They just give you location of the bikes, um, uh, the available bikes that they have, the, the total number of bikes in the station, and so forth. And we can calculate the top 10 stations having bikes um, just using some pretty uh, simple arithmetic. So in this case, all I'm doing is uh, creating empty arrays 
and then taking the keys out of the dictionary. Um, so when we do this, We can see, you know, these are the top 10 stations where uh, the city bike program currently has bikes up to whatever that was 10 seconds ago. Um, East 17th and Broadway uh, has 48 bikes, 81% uh, of their, their bikes remaining. Um, you can see Central Park uh, at number nine only has 69% of their available bikes, so are in uh, Lafayette Street in 8th. Um, so perhaps you'd say that those are more popular locations. Certainly, I would believe riding a bike through Central Park would be uh, a fun activity. Um, so the other thing that we could do is actually do a real-time map. So when I originally started off this talk, I showed that um, the, the map that City Bike shows you, because the arrows are so big, all it does is show you uh, where Manhattan and part of Brooklyn is. Um, but what we can actually do is uh, use a, uh, create a plot in Julia to actually show you where those stations are. Um, so this is going to use Vega, which I'm going to, this will be my transition into talking about Vega. Um, one thing that's, that's great about Vega is that it allows you to make uh, maps, chore plots, and, and such. So um, what I have is a shape file um, uh, that I modified. It was originally New York City with the five boroughs, but the program only goes on in Manhattan and part of Brooklyn. So uh, I took those out of the map because clearly there's not going to be any bike uh, stations there. Um, so this is some really ugly syntax. Um, this is what you need to do at the really low end to, uh, to build a visualization uh, in Vega. However, when I talk about it uh, in a few minutes, you'll see that I've created a much higher level inter interface. So when we plot this, or actually this is just the function itself. Okay. So these are the top 10 stations uh, in New York City right now um, having the most bikes um, for the city bike program. And you know, I put real time in quotes before because I haven't added any animations or anything to this, but their API is so responsive that it would be trivial to um, set up a loop or, or some other functionality to just ping the API every five seconds and just keep redrawing the map. Um, you know, it took a long time to draw the map this time again because it's going through the compilation cycle, but to redraw it again, right, is trivial. So uh, we could actually make a real-time dashboard um, with uh, Escher, and uh, you'd actually be able to see, you know, where um, and, and how people are using bikes. So uh, that's it uh, in terms of uh, the first part of my talk. Uh, hopefully, like I said, this, this was useful for, for some of you. Um, again, everyone here is a Julia enthusiast, or at least most people, so this, this may have been the lightest talk of the, the conference, but you know, for the next 1,000 or 10,000 users, uh, hopefully they appreciate a normal example. Um, so why don't we take a break? Uh, it's 1.53 now. We'll just start at 2 o'clock, if that's fine with everyone. Uh, so the second part of my talk, uh, I wanted to go over um, the, the latest project that I've been working on uh, because it, it 
sort of directly relates to the, the topic um, of the day, uh, everyday analytics and visualization. So um, my subtitle here is Collaborators Wanted. So uh, I resurrected this package from the dead. Um, it would be great if there were other people who wanted to work on it. Uh, so here's just some of the highlights of why we, uh, why we might want to do this. So do we really need another plotting library? And this is sort of the open source uh, tradition of, of duplicating effort everywhere. You know, at one time there was like six testing packages for Julia. Uh, you know, people just kept doing the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, visualization, I might argue, is a little different. Um, yeah, there, there's always room. There, there's a lot of ways to build visualizations. Um, and in this case, what I'm hoping to achieve is a really, really simple interface for plotting. Um, so when we talked about Gadfly before, or if you've used Gadfly in the past, um, it, it's based on the grammar of graphics, which uh, academically is a very great way to think about um, visualization, that each vis visualization is just a series of components that you put together in order to um, convey the relationship you're looking to convey. However, I feel that I can't use Gadfly without always reading the documentation or copying something I've always done because I can't remember if the fill attribute goes into the theme or is a part of the aesthetic or where do I put this and, and, and so forth. And, and so for me, um, this, and th this is, you know, I want to be clear, th this is not me um, criticizing Daniel in any way or uh, Hadley Wickham for you know, ggplot. You know, it's a perfectly valid way to think about um, visualization. I just don't like it. Okay, so um, what I've tried to achieve is to have the most minimalistic interface uh, as possible um, for creating graphics. So where I've defined new functionality uh, Actually, it's good to point out, so John actually started this package. Um, where I'm referring to I, it's, it's still somewhat we because I'm using the code that he started with. Um, if you looked at it today, it may not be familiar, but. Um, so what, what I set out to do was make an extremely simple interface. So what we can see here is for bar plot, creating a bar plot, we have uh, these three arrays, you have X, Y, and then the grouping. And in this case, there are literally only four arguments to this function that you can do. Um, and they all make sense, right? It's like, what data do I want on my X axis? What data do I want on my Y axis? Uh, it's optional to pass the grouping in. Uh, if you didn't do that, you wouldn't have to uh, additionally pass the stacked parameter. Uh, so stacked is false by default. So you would just get a normal bar plot if, if you had two series. Um, but for me, cognitively, it's, it's very easy to just remember these four components. I don't need to look up the documentation. I don't need to do anything. And it's a fairly aesthetically pleasing plot. Um, the default color scheme is not so good. Um, it is a little better than ggplot2, in my opinion, but it still could uh, have some improvement. So, Okay, so why not do it in Gadfly, right? We could, we could try and do the same sort of, actually. Okay, so why not use Gadfly? Well, what if we want to change the colors? You know, you don't like blue, you don't like orange, uh, then what? So for my, uh, for Vega, what I've done is you define the object one time, and then you mutate it, okay? So we already have a bar plot that I've labeled B, okay? And now we say, well, you know what? I don't like the default colors, okay? So I'm gonna take my graph B, and I'm gonna use the, I built the color brewer scale uh, into um, this package. And so it takes uh, an argument, in this case, a, a tuple. So I'm gonna make it green of some sort, okay? And I know I have two, um, I have two groupings. The minimum is three for Color Brewer. Um, uh, 
Uh, okay. So again, I picked the color scheme that, that's kind of washed out. But the point still remains that changing your color here is just saying, hey, you know, I want to change the color of this graph. I, I don't really want to get into, you know, I don't need the finite control where I want to change just one bar. And, and I don't want to have to remember, you know, where the color goes. Here, what I've done with uh, the Vega package is created a series of functions that just mutate the original object and they have really obvious names. So color schemes, pretty easy to remember. There's only two arguments. One of them is uh, the graph that you want to modify. So um, this is what I've been trying to do. So what if you want to do this in Gadfly? So we could do this. Hopefully this doesn't bite me. So, so at the default, I mean, Gadfly can be very, very simple as well. You don't really need a lot of uh, arguments. Um, the way it's set up is there's a one common function plot, and then you start passing the the um, the shading type that you or the uh, the shape that you want, and and the colors, and you know, gr grids, and all sorts of other things. And so when we plot this eventually, okay. So this is roughly similar to what, what I did. Okay, it's not the same, but it's kind of the same concept, right? You pass in your data, you don't care about anything else, you kind of get back what you get back. And then the, the difference between my chart and this chart is well, now the x-axis here doesn't know that it's um, it doesn't have the, the, the same binning, and, and the, the groups are out of order, and the, the x or the y-axis doesn't know how far it should go up. So then we can start manipulating the, the parts of the graph that we want to fix. And once we start doing that, then the, it, it quickly becomes cognitive overload. So, you know, if I want to make the x-axis discrete, okay, now I have to remember that it's in the scale portion of the package. Okay, that's not too bad. Okay, and I want to make y continuous between some set of values. And then when we're talking about the colors of the bars, that's part of scale. Well, I don't think about it that way. I, I think about the scale as being, you know, the axes, but that's where we change our colors. And then I don't like grids uh, on my charts, so I'm going to turn that off. Well, that's part of the theme, okay? So it ends up being that you have to sit there with the documentation open. Um, okay, premature end of input, of course. Okay, so we <laughs> so again it's washed out, but uh, so these these charts are now vaguely similar, right? You know, it's not that um, Vega produces better quality graphics than Gadfly, or Gadfly produces better graphics than Vega. In fact, they both use the same backend engine. Um, they're both related to D3 in, in, in some way. So it's not that you can't do anything, and it's not that I'm introducing any new functionality. It's really just to reduce the cognitive load of not going through all of these steps to um, make a chart. Okay, so both libraries do the same thing. Yeah, they do. Um, like I said, there's a high cognitive cost, and so my goals for this package is really, as I said, to create the minimum declarative uh, plotting syntax so that you can always get back something that's roughly aesthetically pleasing as fast as possible. Um, the, but the second point is, is that because you're mutating the um, object each time, you can actually go inside of the um, Vega type that's defined 
and change any of the properties you wanted to. So if you really wanted to go through the documentation, and by the documentation I mean the Vega documentation, not the Julia documentation, and you wanted to change one property, um, you can actually do that. Um, but in general, really what I'm trying to do is just provide the most common types of graphics um, and, and to be able to get there as fast as possible um, while, while working. Okay, so I just made a few selected examples. Um, the, the documentation for this uh, is under John's name because he started it. Maybe we'll get a custom domain sometime uh, if, if anyone starts using this package. Um, but uh, the absolute current state of the package is, is documented. So um, if, if it's possible, you'll be able to see in the documentation. If it's not possible, it's because it's not. Um, so suppose you want to do uh, an area plot with um, a customized color scheme. So we call area plot, in this case, use the red color scheme, you know, literally you know, milliseconds to render the graph. Um, building maps is a little bit more complex, but it can be done. Um, so right now, the only one is the default one that you see in every other package, which is uh, at the FIPS code level or the, the county code level. And here you can see I've also used um, a, a function called stroke, which only takes one argument saying, you know, by default, I want to draw little arrows, or excuse me, uh, little borders around the chart. Um, if you didn't use stroke, okay, you get something like this. So again, these very, very simple functions that just kind of mutate your, your object. And there's nothing that keeps you from stacking it. So if I, I could actually do, So you can, you can pretty much guess co the colors that are available, greens, purples, reds, yellows. Uh, you can stack those functions on top of each other. Um, it works the same way. It's just as fast. Um, so let's see if I have any more examples. Uh, I have, as far as I know, you can't do this in Gadfly. It's not that it's not possible. It's just that it's not defined. Um, so a population chart where you want to compare uh, two populations on the same relative axes. So this is uh, just population of people by age uh, in 1930. So this is a trivial example, but it just goes to show that, again, these are all one-line things. Most of the um, functions uh, take an X argument, a Y argument, and a group argument. And then you can kind of reason about the other um, the other piece is like, for instance, you do know that there is such a thing as a stacked bar chart, so there's probably a stacked parameter. The pie chart only <laughs> produced, you know, only takes one uh, set of values, so there's no X parameter. So again, I'm trying to make it really low cognitive overhead of, of making graphics very quickly. Um, so collaborators want it. So, uh, you know, for a while this was just abandoned. Um, I just got bored one day uh, at the same time as being interested in interactive web graphics, so I decided to fix it. Um, Vega works on both uh, uh, version three and version four of Julia, so you know, no matter which one you pick, uh, it will work fine. Um, the code base is relatively simple, all the plumbing's there. So this uh, works inside of Jupyter Notebook, and it works at the REPL. So if you are working at the REPL, it will open your browser automatically and then show it in your browser. Um, so this is actually very useful. So what ends up happening is if I need to make uh, a graphic um, for sharing, I often uh, do it in the notebook and then copy the code into the REPL so it'll just put it in a nice blank web page, and then it's very easy to uh, just make a, a screen print uh, of the um, graphic that way, and then you can put it in PowerPoint or Keynote or whatever that Linux slideware is that everybody uses, or LaTeX or whatever. Um, 
there's also an online editor um, where you can actually see other examples. So here, if you wanted to start participating, you know, I want to build, eventually build force directed network graphs. Um, and luckily, um, Trifacta, which is the group that um, built the Vega library, has provided examples. So in order to get this into Julia, you basically just need to map some or all of this code on the left, which is just plain JSON into the Julia types, and eventually a force-directed graph would come out. So anyone who's really interested, again, who, who wants to contribute somewhere, but you know, is kind of intimidated by anything, you know, really you know, willing to work with anyone um, to kind of see if it can make this, uh, make Vega uh, a useful package. And the to-do list is quite extensive. So uh, while you can do a lot of things, uh, there's a lot of things you can't do. Um, so we don't need to go through this, but I mean, you know, there's any number of things I have in the to-do list. So again, if there were people who wanted to contribute, I'll eventually put this to-do list uh, inside the package so that people can see it. Um, but you know, you can modify functions that are already there, create new visualizations. Um, do, just do things plain better, make them faster, whatever. Um, write documentation. Uh, I'm really open to anything. So if, if there's people that, like I said, are out there, you know, like Leah's presentation, um, if you want to do something a little bit further than correcting people's typos, you know, this might be a great place um, to actually do so. So if there's anyone interested, just kind of throwing that out there. Uh, otherwise, that's it. Thank you. No, uh, are there any questions? I think so. Is Vega pretty stable at this point? Uh, in what way? Uh, well, it's, it's a sort of middleware of a sort. Um, right. Programming language is right? So, yeah. Right. So Vega is a wrapper on D3. So just to give the, the background I didn't have since I have a few more minutes. So D3 is really low level, and you have to program in JavaScript, and you have to attach all the properties to your data points and tell, tell the browser where you want to put them and so forth. And then Vega is a wrapper around D3 that's declarative. So you use JSON to um, tell the Vega JS library how to plot D3. Okay? But as it turns out, uh, writing JSON is not particularly pleasing either. In fact, it, it may be worse than writing JavaScript itself. Uh, it's easier, but the nesting is kind of so-so. And so Vega itself is very stable. Um, they're somewhat in a transition period. So um, they're on, I guess, version 1.5. And it's kind of silent right now. I, I talked to the maintainers of the project. And they're actually writing a second version which is why you don't see a lot of talk of Vega. Uh, the second version is going to have a lot more interactivity, um, so you can do more compound type of graphs. So like if you, um, I've ever seen some, some of those graphs like in the New York Times where you, you move a slider and like three other sliders move because you know, four data elements are all um, a function of that. They're, they're, they're building that type of functionality in. So, um, but as far as the JavaScript goes, um, yeah, it's as stable as, as anything. There, there's never, um, the, the JavaScript library is actually part of the Vega library. So in terms of Julia stability, it's going to be as stable as anything because uh, I'm not going to switch a JavaScript library out. So. Until they do version two. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you for listening to my talk, and uh, I don't know.